It's February 1st, 1908, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. The official investigation into the murder that happened today in history in 1908 was never completed. And you know, when you're the king and no one can be bothered to find out who killed you, you've got to know the writing was on the wall. (laughs) Death was probably heading your way anyway. Uh, But it was on this day that the penultimate Portuguese monarch, King Carlos I, and his eldest son, Luis Philippe, were assassinated by Republican gunmen as they rode their carriage through Lisbon. Yeah, it happened about 20 past five in the afternoon as the royal coach was passing across the Praça do Comercio, which is a large stately square which faces onto the riverfront in Lisbon. The king was with his wife, Queen Amelie, and their two sons, Louis Philippe, the crown prince, who was 20, and 18-year-old Manuel, were inside. It was an open carriage. They were returning from a hunting trip, getting try, getting away from all the stress of being so unpopular with the people. <laughs> um, and they were unaware that six members of a conspiracy to assassinate the king were planted around the square and As the coach passed, Manuel Buisa, who is a 32-year-old teacher and, crucially, former army sharpshooter, drew a Winchester carbine from inside his coat and opened fire from about eight metres behind. The first shot hit Carlos in the neck, killing him instantly. Yeah, and that was at close range. So the shots fired by the second gunman, Alfredo Costa, he jumped by that point onto the carriage and was shooting them point blank. Mm. So what's absolutely extraordinary, thinking about it now, was that although obviously it was very tragic for all royalists in Portugal on this day, they didn't get the Queen and she was right there. Mm. She fended them off with a bouquet of flowers. <laughs> Had this yeah. guy popping shots at both her children and killing her husband. And she's right there and somehow in this hail of bullets doesn't get killed. Mm. Yeah, her initial reaction was to shield Manuel, her youngest son, and then she, yeah, she swiped at them with the bouquet and she cried, infamous, infamous. And in the end, Manuel escaped with only a single bullet wound to the arm. And the, the assassins continued to fire until they were gunned down by police and soldiers. Obviously, Luis Felipe did not walk away from being shot through the skull, so he also died on the scene. Yeah, had automatic accession to the throne been the law, Luis Felipe would have been one of the shortest reigning monarchs in history with a reign of just 20 minutes between the time that his father died (laughs) and he died. But as it happens, they both got killed. The monarchy did actually survive through Prince Manuel, but it only actually lived for another two years after this, I guess, because as you're saying, Ollie, you know, in a situation like this... Republicans going to republic. Yeah, Republicans (laughs) are going to republic, and that they did. (laughs) Yeah, uh, and he was only 18 as well, Manuel II. I mean, and, you know, obviously pretty traumatised, but he then had to become king and quickly try and somehow overcome the Republican tide. I mean, there was some sympathy, obviously, for what had happened to his family. So in the short term, he was able to get some good press. And he tried to do some modern progressive things. He appointed a renowned French sociologist to look into living conditions in Portugal, for example. Yeah, he reported back... The, the living conditions are awful. <laughs> your reign is in some trouble. Leave the country, Your, your Highness. Uh, and the Kingdom of Portugal came to end with a military coup uh, supported by Republican agitators in 1910. And Manuel II went into exile in Great Britain with his mum. But... We need to talk about why Mm. they hated the royal family so much in the first place. Well, you know, there is a bit of a parallel between the situation at the very end of the monarchy with Manuel II and the situation that his father, the assassinated Carlos I, encountered when he came to the throne. He also came to the throne young, not as young as Manuel. Uh, He was 26. Great age for a king. Mm. Who doesn't want a 26-year-old king? (laughs) Uh, Yeah, and he had been trained from birth for this role, so it was perfect for the job. However, it was a really difficult time for Portugal. You touched on living conditions. The country was really lagging behind its Western European rivals in basically every measure of progress. You know, literacy, economy. There were two national bankruptcies, one in 1892 and one in 1902. And all of this was obviously stoking, in turn, political turmoil. There was industrial action, political radicalism, and a growing Republican movement. And all of this was further inflamed by the fact that in 1889 Brazil had deposed its emperor and declared itself a republic. So to Portuguese anti-monarchists, it must have been both inspiring and frustrating to see a former colonial possession shake off its monarchy. But the real turning point was this thing that happened in 1890, the so-called British ultimatum. I knew it would be awful. 
Why is I it know, awful? Cancel culture is, gone mad. <laughs> this one's a little bit on us, I have to say. <laughs> Portugal had been one of the earliest colonial powers to expand into Africa, and they'd established colonies in modern-day Angola and Mozambique, and those are on opposite coasts of Africa. And so they had this idea, it was called the Pink Map, that they would join up those two colonies and make a sort of big, thick band of Portuguese African territory. And that would have covered modern-day Zambia, parts of Zimbabwe and Malawi. But the British were not very keen on this idea. They already had a foothold in that area. And basically... Basically, the Portuguese were forced to make a humiliating stand down. They signed this this document called the Treaty of London. And not only did it bring down the government, it also sparked widespread disgust with the king. He was seen as being hand in hand with the prime minister. And although behind the scenes, Carlos had actually done everything he could to leverage all his diplomatic influence, he ended up being associated with this national humiliation. Yeah, and what Britain was trying to do was that they owned Cape Town and also Cairo, and they were trying to establish a railway that went from the bottom to the top. <laughs> literally like Monopoly, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> so, so We've got the while, brown set and the green set. We need the electric work. Yeah. So while, exactly. So while Portugal was drawing a sort of horizontal line through the continent, Britain was in the process of drawing a, a vertical line through the continent. And, and the ultimatum basically said, we will cut off our diplomatic ties with Portugal if you don't accede to what we're telling you. But but Carlos probably rightly interpreted it as we will go to war with you and knowing that that would be a bad idea at mm. the time, just basically back down. And yes, that made him unpopular. But the other thing that contributed to his downfall was that, you know, through this time of great economic deprivation, he was busy living the high life. And so as the crisis got worse and this Republican agitation grew, Carlos dissolved Parliament and appointed João Franco as Prime Minister, which really meant virtual dictator and the popular perception was that Franco was basically there to siphon money from the treasury to go directly to Carlos himself to just subsidize his own personal spending and there was more gossip around him and his personal life as well one of the things he was reportedly spending money on was his Parisian mistress and also his wife Amelie the one who survived I mean this is a weird thing but she was six foot tall apparently which made her unpopular it's strange because it's not even a particularly visual culture then, but people felt she was kind of towering over them and judging them. Well, I mean, probably because most of the people were malnourished and stunted. They probably well, didn't yes. like her flaunting her healthy height <laughs> yeah. over them. But also, if you look at, like, um, the Republican share of the popular vote, it was low. Mm. So, you know, you, you wouldn't think on paper that he had anything to worry about. They were getting 2.7%. But then you look at who was voting, and it's back to what you were saying about literacy, Rebecca. Around 75% of the adult population at the turn of the century in Portugal were illiterate and therefore not allowed to vote. Well, the funny thing is as well that the assassination came about almost immediately after this thing called the elevator coup, which does sound like it all took place inside an elevator, which it didn't. It was named... <laughs> You've got at... five minutes to pull <laughs> off this coup. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Give me your king within three sentences. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it was, actually, it was actually called that because uh, that was where they arrested most of the conspirators who had been hanging around by the this municipal library elevator as one of the rallying points from which the coup was meant to take place. But the Republican group, because it was so broad, as you were saying, Rebecca, they were entirely confident of being able to do what they wanted to do and establish this new political system that they were just talk. Everyone was talking about it. And one of the conspirators blabbed to a, uh, a police officer who he assumed would be on their side. And that police officer went back and pretty much just told on them, and that was what led to all of these arrests, particularly the ones uh, taking place in this uh, in this lift shaft. <laughs> yeah, this reaction was the tipping point because the Prime Minister, Jean Franco, had already cracked down on civil liberties, press freedom, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and he was seen as being hand in hand with King Carlos. And then in response to this failed coup, the government sought royal assent from Carlos for powers to transport anyone deemed to be, quote, subverting public order without trial. You know, they would be transported to a Portuguese colony. And Carlos himself knew that it was a step too far. As he, When he signed it, he said, I signed my sentence of death, but you gentlemen want it that way. But actually, it turned out that the assassination plans were already in place. Well, except because, as I alluded to in my intro, there was never a proper investigation into this, or there was, but the conclusion was never published. We actually don't know for sure whether the plot to assassinate the king was the one that was being enacted on this day. It is possible mm. that the people that were there had intended to assassinate Franco, the prime minister, but he was out. So they were like, well, let's go for the next best thing, which is the king. This is the only monarch ever 
in Portugal to have been assassinated. And yet we don't really know why. He had three royal nicknames. You know, like you've got your William the Conqueror and your Ivan the Terrible. So mm. he had a couple of bog standard ones. He had the Carlos the Diplomat. Yeah, he tried. Carlos the Martyr, you know, obviously understandable. And also <laughs> Carlos the Oceanographer. Which yes, made me think, he was apparently really into, like he understood stuff properly about, about yeah. ship going and seafaring. Yeah. I'm not saying that it wasn't a representative nickname, but it did yes. make me think, I'm not sure that the 20th century is like the best wellspring of epithets. Do you know what I mean? Let's stick with like medieval words. Yes, Let's yeah, not yeah, do yeah. Carlos the Oceanographer. <laughs> Tomorrow. He'd succumb to the emotional excesses of Hollywood. I think that was met with, yeah, sort of almost a feeling of betrayal. Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts. Part of the ACAST Creator Network.